God is that mysterious force, and you can give it many names, as many religions do, which works upon us and through us to seek and achieve truth, beauty, and goodness. God is perhaps best understood as our ultimate concern, that in which we should place our highest hopes, confidence, and trust. And I think God is better understood as a verb rather than a noun. God is not an asserted existence, but a process accomplishing itself. And God is inescapable. It is the life force that sustains, transforms, and ultimately defines existence. The name of God is laden thanks to our religious institutions and the numerous tyrants, charlatans, and demagogues these institutions produced with so much baggage and imagery that it's hard for us to see the intent behind the concept. All societies and cultures have struggled to describe these forces. It is why Freud avoided writing about the phenomena of love. It is by the seriousness of our commitments to compassion. Indeed, our ability to sacrifice for the other, especially for the outcast and the stranger, our commitment to justice, the core message of the prophets, that we alone can measure the quality of faith. This is the true meaning of faith. As Matthew wrote, by their fruits shall you know them. Professed faith, what we say we believe, is not faith. It is an expression of loyalty to a community, to our tribe. Faith is what we do. This is real faith. And faith is the sister of justice. Those who silenced Jesus represented all human societies, not the Romans or the Jews. When Jesus attacks the chief priests, scribes, lawyers, Pharisees, Sadducees, and other blind guides, he is attacking forms of oppression as endemic to Christianity as to all religions and all ideologies and all institutions. If civil or religious authority enforces an iron and self-righteous conformity among members of a community, and faith is transformed into ideology. Faith is not in conflict with reason. Faith does not conflict with scientific truth unless faith claims to express a scientific truth. Faith can neither be affirmed nor denied by scientific, historical, or philosophical truth. And here I think Hitchens confuses the irrational, which he sees as an endemic part of faith, with the non-rational. There is a spiritual dimension to human existence and the universe, but this is not irrational. It is non-rational. Faith allows us to transcend what Flaubert said was our mania for conclusions, a mania he described as one of humanity's most useless and sterile drives. The sole reliance on reason, faith in human reason, allows us to ignore the dark Freudian undercurrents that lead to self-worship. And it leads to a dangerous form of idolatry, a form of faith, certainly, but one most of the biblical writers knew led to evil and eventually self-destruction. Hitchens states that the whole record will show, first, that person for person, American free thinkers and agnostics and atheists come out the best. He assures us that someone's secular or free thinking opinion would cause him or her to denounce injustice. This assertion, coming from an apologist for the war in Iraq, for the crime of aggression committed by the Bush administration in our name, is to say the least rich. But <coughs> The danger, which I think Hitchens fails to see, is not Islam or Christianity or any other religion. It is the human heart, the capacity we all have for evil. All human institutions, including religious institutions, with a lust for power, give their utopian visions divine sanction. Whether this comes through the worship of God, destiny, historical inevitability, the master race, a worker's paradise, fraternite, egalite, liberte, or the second coming of Jesus Christ. And religion is often a convenient vehicle for this bloodlust. Religious institutions often sanctify genocide. But this says more about us 
about the nature of human institutions and the darkest human yearnings than it does about religion. His book finally externalizes evil, and when you externalize evil, all tools, including violence and torture, become legitimate. This is an assault on what he defines as the irrational force of religion. But once we begin this assault, it permits us to sanction the abuse and subjugation of others. This is done in the name of another particular version of goodness, the goodness of reason. But this too is a false god, an idol. Once you wage unprovoked wars and embrace torture, you unleash sadists and killers. You consign other human beings to moral oblivion. You become no better than those you opposed. Hitchens does what fundamentalists do. He embraces a self-serving and I think finally simplistic view of religion and the world. And this allows him to create an illusion of a binary world of us and them, of reason versus irrationality, of the forces of light battling the forces of darkness. And once you set up this vision, it becomes possible to view anything that will, view anything that will subdue what is defined as irrational and dangerous as necessary. Necessity, William Pitt wrote, is the plea for every infringement of human freedom. Thank you. I don't have the uh, white noise ability to invoke faith um, as my opponent does, but I will remind you all, ladies and gentlemen, that I, I offered you a fair bet at the beginning, and I, I included my opponent um, as I now think of him. Um, <laughs> In the wager, can you name a moral action committed by somebody in the name of their God or their church that you could not have committed yourself? And I'm still waiting for anyone to get up and say, this could only have been done by faith. And I'm still waiting for him to say so too. I'll make that point. On not your point about the secular, oh, the secular atrocious. I care about it enough to develop a whole passage, a whole chapter of my book uh, to it available, by the way, at fine bookstores everywhere. I am still a materialist. In this form, um, you can be an atheist and a sadist, or a nihilist, or a fascist, or a communist, but it's not necessitated, because you don't invoke supernatural aid for your view. You don't say, I'm doing this because God makes me do so, thus you have to do so too. You take your chances. Put the case, if you like, since it comes up all the time, of Joseph Dugashvili, Sarianovich, uh, the Georgian despot, uh, in Russia in 1917. Millions of millions of Russians for hundreds and hundreds of years have been told, without any contradictory evidence, that the head of their state was not just an absolutist uh, despot who owned everyone and everything within the borders of Russia, but that he was also the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. And if a little below the angels, a little above the common human level, that was their model, and that's what they believed. If you're Joseph Stalin, you shouldn't even be in the dictatorship business if you can't exploit a pool of credulity and servility and stupidity that has been left to you like that by your Christian predecessors. You, you're not, and he, he'd been a seminarian all his life, remember. He, he would think that this is too easy. I can stage an inquisition, which he did. I can stage a heresy hunt for heretics, which he did. I can offer miracles, which with Lysenko's pseudo-biology promising three a harvest a year, he also did. I can find out who Satan is working with within the borders of our wonderful dominion easily, and I can print it in Pravda. The whole thing is a, is a horrible simulacrum of what had been left to the abandoned, despised, uh, ground-down Russian people by their, by their education in Christianity. Now, if there's to be a level playing field, which I know that uh, my opponents don't wish for, I want to be told how it is that any society that follows the precepts of Lucretius and of Spinoza and of Galileo and of Russell and of Voltaire and Jefferson and Paine and Einstein has ever fallen into the same pit of ignorance, famine, cruelty, stupidity, hysteria, witch hunting that is the special privilege of the faithful. So that's my short answer to your question.
Let's try that for an experiment and see who comes out better. Uh, Chris Hedges. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate institutional religion as much as Christopher does. You prefer um, individual. And, and, but I think that, you know, and, and this is something that uh, you know, numerous writers, you know, from, from Dostoevsky, I mean, even Beckett, I think in some ways is a deeply, probably the most authentically religious writer of the 20th century um, in, in understanding the kind of morally neutral universe in which we live and that, that need for interconnectedness, um, you know, that mystery that surrounds us. And all societies and all cultures have struggled to give words to this mystery, this transcendence. That is the religious impulse. Uh, of course, there are many people who have done uh, what I would define as deeply ethical uh, acts uh, that don't come out of a religious tradition. Uh, but I think, and again, going back to the Tillich quote, I think, you know, all institutions, as soon as uh, belief systems be become institutionalized, they become, in Tillich's words, demonic, that institutions seek their own power and their own self-perpetuation. And I think what we're doing here is confusing uh, the very dark history of religious institutions and, the, and that fusion of uh, religious iconography and religious language with the iconography and language of nationalism, a frightening and toxic mix is, uh, throughout history and certainly something that we both saw in the Balkans, uh, from that authentic uh, religious impulse which is palpable within human society. It's real. It's why, uh, you know, science or can, can study sexual urges and lust, uh, but it fails finally when it tries to study love. It's why even, even Freud himself gave up and, and quite publicly said it was something that, it was, that he couldn't grapple with. And I think that's what we're dealing with. I, I you know, especially coming out of the church, uh, I have a great deal of anger um, and, and maybe even more anger in some ways than Christopher does uh, towards the bigots uh, who wrap themselves, uh, you know, in the American flag and clutch the Christian cross. But I think we do have to make a distinction between those impulses that I would describe as religious, essentially non-rational, um, and religious institutions.